we have the power through our culture to change it. And we should ask ourselves the question of whether what we think is real is real. Is it in nature or did we make it? You know, stigma is not in nature. It's something that we learn and we can always change what we teach. Hello and welcome to another episode of Idioms of Normality brought to you by Traces Dreams. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Mason, and this week's guest has written a book called Nobody's Normal. Professor Richard Roy Grinker, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's delightful to talk to you. Now tell me, what brought you to write a book called Nobody's Normal? How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. Many, many things brought me to write this book, but I have an unusual biography that involves mental health, which is that my great grandfather was a psychiatrist who thought that people with mental illnesses should be basically, you know, bred out of the human race. He was a eugenicist. And then my grandfather was a psychiatrist and he worked on the concept of normality. And in World War II, as people began to say that those soldiers who were suffering from mental illnesses due to the trauma of war were, were somehow weak or abnormal. He said, no, these are normal people in abnormal circumstances. And then he went on to critique on normality after the war. And then my father was a psychiatrist. And then I was supposed to be a psychiatrist. I married a psychiatrist. I have a, a daughter with autism. She's 29. She was diagnosed when she was a little more than two years old and at that time non-speaking. And despite the fact that all of these generations lived at different times and with different sensibilities and different values, they all taught me one thing, which is when people have a developmental disability or when people have a mental illness, they suffer from a double illness. First, the condition itself. And secondly, the negative social judgment or the stigma. So I wanted to write about this. I suppose part of it was to atone for my sin of not becoming a psychiatrist. That's quite the history. And that's, that's four generations of, of psychiatrists and then an anthropologist. Hang on, or three and an now. anthropologist. But, you know, anthropology is great because you can, you can critique everything. So you can work on psychiatry, but you do it from a very critical perspective so that you, you could do it but not actually have to buy into all the orthodoxy, right? I mean, this is the great thing about anthropology. A lot of people think it's that you go and travel to different places and understand different cultures, but that's just half of it. The other half is to come back to your own world and you see it in a different light, right? So if you, whether you step outside into another culture or you step outside into a different historical period, when you come back and you look at the present, you see it with a more detached view and you can look at it critically, which is what I've done in this book. I mean, Nobody's Normal is very much a critique of the way in which the concept of normal has been used to demean people, to marginalize people, to shame people. But it also is a book about the progress that we're making to eradicate that progress that is evidenced in many, many different ways, not the least of which is, you know, a show like yours. So without, without further ado, I should jump in with the first question, which is, what is normal? You know, normal's been used in a lot of different ways and a lot of different times, but essentially the way it has become used in modern times is that normal is what we value as the good or the ideal. You know, in the past, before the mid 20th century, normal was more of a mathematical term, right? It meant average, the norm. But it is only now, as many historians of normality, including those that have been on your show, who are professors in Australia, have written, only recently has it become something that we aspire to as an ideal. And Ruth Benedict, an anthropologist long ago, said, normal is really a variant of the ideal or what we value. And so if we value people who have unusual skills, who are on the autism spectrum, then that can become normal. My grandfather did research on normality too in the mid 20th century. And he really found that the normal was something quite boring, I guess. An astounding thing to say in the 1960s. It's, it's funny though, because normal 
on the surface, it does seem benign. It does seem inoffensive, very non-threatening. And yet normal can be a Trojan horse for a quite anxiogenic set of beliefs about what we should be and how we should act in society. Right, because there's no concept of normality without its pair, abnormality. And but I tell you, the study that he did in the early 60s was fascinating. You know, at that time in Chicago where he was working, what the typical expert on mental health would do is they would look at a population, they would find out who qualified or didn't qualify for a mental illness, and then those who didn't qualify would be excluded from the study and they wouldn't pay attention to them. In other words, you wouldn't even look at the normal people. And he thought, well, let's take a look at the normal people in a study. We'll get rid of all the abnormal ones and we'll just look at the normal ones and characterize them. And he said, well, let's see, they are, the normal ones seem to be lacking in any creativity. They have very low ambition. They're average students. They're not very ambitious. They are in a word, boring. And he asked this question in 1961 in the archives of general psychiatry, the you know, most prestigious journal in the field, is this the cost of normality? And he had to repeat that question in order to make sure that the reader didn't think it was a joke. Is the cost of normality a kind of bland person? Did he come to a, did he answer that question? No, he didn't really answer it, but I think asking the question implied the answer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a rhetoric question, but uh, if we were to take it seriously as a a scientific hypothesis or uh, something that we study, it's an interesting idea that if normality is something that we aspire to, but normality is also something quite boring, then... Then we should critique what we're aspiring to. (laughs) We should criticize it. If we get rid of this thing that we call abnormal, then we're getting rid of creativity and innovation and spark and all of the things that make us interesting as human beings. Now, this is not in any way to deny suffering, right? It's not to say that people don't have mental illnesses. It's not to say that people don't suffer, but it is to say that our concept of normality is one that is really of conformity to an average. That and yet for some people, it can be so hard to conform to the average. It can be so hard to achieve normality. It takes a lot of work. It means going to a therapist. It means maybe following a particular treatment or the effort that goes into acting normal in society can be a big effort. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, sure. I mean, even in the context of COVID, of this pandemic, I'm finding in my interviews that a lot of the uh, young adults and uh, adolescents who were, had been in school and who have been had, you know, compelled to do remote school are actually doing really well at home remotely because their work day or their school day was so anxious trying to, especially for people with autism who are aware of their differences, you know, all really trying to hide those differences, uh, trying to anticipate social responses, trying to, to work so hard during the day, they'd get home and be exhausted. And I'm hearing reports now from clinicians and interviews with, you know, quote unquote, high functioning autistic adults and, and, uh, and teenagers who are saying that they're able to relax a little bit more and explore new interests, whether it's music or art or, or other things. In the past, they'd get home from school and all they could do is maybe just, you know, plop down and watch TV or something to veg out because they were just exhausted from all the hard work of trying to fit in, yeah. you know? And then you start to do remote communication and everybody doing remote communication shares all of the the discomforts and the awkwardness, not knowing how to interrupt or how to pause. Some of it's slow and offers clarification that's, that's greater than in, if you're in person. And so there are some people who are being more social because of remote work and yeah. remote communication. But that, tr- that work of trying to fit in, that's tough. That's really, and, really tough. And not just the work to try and fit in, but also the, the work to try and not to stand out the work to try and avoid appearing abnormal. It it expends so much energy. 
Well, and the thing is, Paul, that the the great advances that I'm seeing, the great progress, the really positive signs that we're reducing the stigma of mental illness have to do with standing out, of making yourself seen in the terms that you want, right? To to be seen as you want to be seen and to define yourself for yourself rather than have others define you. Like the student who stands up in the front of a lecture class and says at the beginning of the semester, I have Tourette's disorder. I may say something that is awkward or startles you or even is offensive. The person with autism who says to the professor, I've got poor eye contact, but I am paying attention. You know, these are the, the heroes these days who are saying, I'm not going to try to fit in. I'm going to say what I am and I'm going to define myself for myself and I'm going to disarm the power of words that other people use to hurt me by taking ownership of it myself. Particularly in the autism community uh, who... I believe the phrase neuro or the term neurodiversity was coined amongst the neurodiversity community. Are we embracing diversity more? And is this solving some of the problems created by the very eugenic drive to be normal? I do think so. I do think you're right about that. The changes that we're seeing are, are not just, you know, in neurodiversity, but it's a it's a kind of diversity movement that is a tide raising all boats. It has to do with, um, with you know, whether it's queer uh, uh, studies or fat studies or crip studies or uh, disability studies, civil rights and other kinds of movements that are all kind of um, changing this concept of what we value. So one of the things I do in Nobody's Normal is I say that education and awareness seem to be the major uh, methods that advocacy organizations are using to try and decrease the stigma of various kinds of differences, including developmental disabilities and mental illnesses, but that education and awareness are not really the answer. Um, Ignorance uh, does not cause stigma as much as what our ideals of the good person are. And so where we see the stigma of mental illness really take off and begin is in the industrial revolution, when we begin to value people who produce the most, people who are autonomous, independent human beings, responsible to no one but themselves, accountable to no one but themselves, except maybe God. And uh, and then we devalue the person who doesn't produce as much. And the first asylums were not for people who were sick. It was for the first asylums were for people who were idle, who did not work. And they weren't brought there by police or the state. They were brought to these asylums by their families because they were a drag on their household economy. But think about what's happened in the technological revolution now, where we can start to value people who do different kinds of work. And we're starting to kind of deconstruct the idea that if you're a stay-at-home parent, you're somehow of no value, or that if you are a volunteer, or if you're an artist or a musician who isn't, you know, extremely wealthy, that you have value. We're, we're, We're allowing, making room for people with disabilities to work when we didn't before because we didn't value them as real contributors to our communities and our society. And so I think that we need to focus less on whether we're educated and aware of things and more on this question of what does it mean to lead a meaningful life? What do we consider to be a good life? If we take that question seriously, what does it mean to have a fulfilling life? What does it mean to have a meaningful life? Does that mean we can put away questions of what does it mean to have a normal life or how do I obtain the normal life? Well, I think that what it means is that people have the agency and the ability to say what constitutes a meaningful life for them. And then, um, yes, we, we, we do get rid of this uh, concept of the normal because people are saying, I'm going to do what I want to do. Uh, not what everybody else might think I should do. 
right? As an anthropologist, that must be an interesting thing to study because if you're a philosopher, you might be interested in the epistemology of normality. But as an anthropologist, we're interested in how these concepts motivate people to take action or to act and be in the world. But there's also another step here is as a, as a, as a parent, as someone who's engaged with the psychiatric, the, the psychiatry community, there's also some feedback that, that you're positioned to provide on the concept of normality. And is it a concept that is worth hanging on to? Is it a concept that we should keep? Or is it a concept that should be dismantled and we need to move on? Well, I think it's a damaging illusion that we should get rid of if we can in some way. I mean, the word itself, normal, is not one that anybody really wanted in the first place. It kind of entered into the popular language, popular discourse uh, in the mid 20th century. And if it's so new, I think we can, we can get rid of it. What really is crucial is that when you do anthropological fieldwork and you go to other places, most societies don't have a word for normal. Most societies don't have a word for homosexual, like a kind of person. There are most societies don't have a concept of a distinctly mental illness. So we could certainly get rid of concepts. I mean, there's no problem getting rid of them. But of course, we're human beings and we speak and we use language and we classify and we categorize. So we will always have something in our language that we need to use to communicate and to classify, right? Mm -hmm. But that changes over time. And a word that might be demeaning at one point, we get rid of. And we replace it. And the English language is dynamic. Every language is dynamic, right? And so, you know, we used to talk about, we used to have classifications like uh, imbecile and lunatic and feeble-minded. Oh, I and, get called those all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we've gotten rid of those. Um, take Asperger's. That's a really interesting word because uh, it was so important. We needed it so badly. 20 years ago because autism was so stigmatized and people really needed a term that denoted somebody with autism who could actually go to school and be educated and who was capable of communicating. And yet the word had so much power autism as, you know, this devastating thing and people sending their kids to residential institutions and that it was, you know, destined to a life of, of, of isolation. And we needed the term Asperger's. It wasn't because there was some scientific discovery where anybody said, oh, I've found this new thing under the microscope called Asperger's that I'm going to now use. It was because we needed a less stigmatizing term. But then over 20 years, look what happened. The word autism, autism expanded into this spectrum, which Asperger's helped to achieve. And now autism is not very much stigmatized the way it used to be. And so we don't need Asperger's anymore. Now, the clinicians will tell you something else. The psychometric testers will say, no, 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 Grinker, you're wrong. The reason that we got rid of Asperger's is because we realized that no, even the best neuropsychiatric neuropsych testers could not reliably distinguish between subtypes of autism. But that's a post hoc explanation. Then why did you introduce it in the first place in 1994 if you couldn't reliably distinguish between the subtypes? So I really think it's because the word Asperger's did a job, did a great job. Now we don't need it anymore. I mean, you could still use it if it helps you with your identity and framing yourself and explaining yourself, but we don't need it in science anymore because uh, it did its job. And so there's another example of a concept or a word that we can get rid of, but we're always gonna classify, right, Paul? If I didn't classify, I'd meet you on the street and I'd say, how's the large formless blob today? And you would say, thank you for asking, Richard. It's large and without form. And we'd go on our way <laughs> and it would be the end of the discussion. We have to classify the world. We just have to constantly work to make sure that our classifications are helpful and not hurtful. I think that's a really beautiful point to make, that, that we can have classifications that are inclusive, that are not damaging, that are not discriminatory, and that vocabulary changes and morphs so that we can, because uh, we, 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 we use these identity markers as a means of navigating society, as a, as a means of mobility, as a means of going to school, getting access to resources. 
And previously, when having a a diagnosis might have denied you access to resources, now a a diagnosis gives you access to resources. And and as these definitions expand and contract in relation to cultural movements, uh, you know, I think this highlights the the importance of of the anthropological gaze, which is different from the clinicians who who take a very different stamp. And one of the things an anthropologist often finds is that they'll often conduct analysis with their interlocutors, with the people that they're studying. But there sometimes comes a moment where people say something and do something else and their actions and what what they say and what they don't do don't always line up. And I, I find the topic of normality so interesting there because normality is one where people say oh, normal is not real, or there's no such thing as normal. Mm -hmm. Uh, And yet you look at their behaviours and they act as though it's real. They pursue normality for themselves. They look to achieve normality. They look to display normality often, not always. Um, You you gave some examples of people who purposefully didn't try to uh, display their normality. But in my experience, I, I find that people in most work contexts, for example, try to demonstrate that they are productive, that they are achieving normality. And yet, if you were to quiz them on the topic of normality, they might come to the conclusion, oh, normality is fabricated, it doesn't exist. And yet they're still still bound by it. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, we're all members of our own societies. And as much as we try to step out of it and critique it and and fight it, we, we get caught up in it, right? You know, every anti-racist has some racism in them, right? As an example, right? That we can't totally escape the worlds in which we've been raised. But I think that when you frame your comment or your question, you're, you're also talking about how much work everybody puts in to try and not be hurt, and not be marked out as different in a bad way. And that's really the damage of normality is as a concept is how much pain it causes us uh, to try and be, you know, achieve this unachievable ideal, Mm. which we know is something that culture shapes. Mm. And if culture shapes it, we can change it. It's not innate, nothing that we consider to be normal is in nature. There's no normal body mass index in nature that says what's thin, fat, obese, whatever. There's no blood pressure level that's in nature that is nature says is normal. And there's no brain that is normal either, unless you want to create culturally some kind of normality. And then science does the work for culture. So culture says, okay, we, we want to identify what's the normal a uh, uh, brain, and so, or then you know, the normal person, and so they look only at white brains, or they only they look only at white people. And they say, okay, so here is the norm that you must achieve, and then anybody who is diverse or a person of color is somehow abnormal by virtue of that. Um, I think that what we are achieving now in society is a, a all over the world is an attempt to tell people that they don't have to hide. See, where stigma really has its power is in secretiveness. One of the things I talk about in Nobody's Normal is an Australian uh, executive named Michael Fieldhouse, um, who uh, is an executive at a cybersecurity company. And he told me that the effect of having an autism hiring program at his company has been that it has made mental health in general something that now people can be more open about. And he said, you know, if you're in a construction business, you're always talking about chiropractors and pain and muscles and fitness and all that stuff. If you're in a cognitive field, why aren't you talking about cognition and mood and thought and all those things? You should. And he told me a story when he was in Washington, D.C., before the pandemic. And he said that a woman had come to him and had complained uh, not really complained, but she just said she didn't feel herself. She wanted to make sure that he understood that she wasn't sure her work was up to snuff, you know, up to par right now because she was going through menopause and she was having symptoms related to menopause. And he looked at me 
as we sat there in my office, he said, what an amazing thing. How did we get to this place where a woman comes to her male manager, feels comfortable enough to say that to identify herself, not just as a woman in business, but an aging woman in business, something that's just sort of normal hormonal changes and, you know, part of human development. Um, what an amazing thing. And he just was stunned by it. And he totally attributed it this to the like, neurodiversity thing. I mean, this was something about menopause, but he, he sees it as something that's generalized from the neurodiversity movement. It's a beautiful story because it indicates that she didn't fear getting hurt in that conversation. She felt safe. And I guess the, the thing to highlight there is previously, I think we recognize that the public discourse did not permit conversations like that without one of those parties feeling shame or voicing disdain or one of those parties fearing getting hurt. And when you mentioned the idea that we seek normality because we're, we're trying to avoid pain, that really struck home for me. The idea that, you know, if we can reduce the possibility that someone will fear pain, then suddenly it permits very open dialogues that are much more productive, that are much more... Yes. Yeah. Um, and this is why, this is, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm, I'm just exercised <laughs> because it's a great conversation. But like, this is why I am actually in favor of the colloquial use of mental illness terms, even when they don't like, you know, fit the clinical realm. Uh, let me say what, what I mean a little bit more clearly. You know, a lot of people sometimes say, oh, I'm a neat neck, or now they say I'm a little OCD. You know, you're interviewing a roommate. Well, how neat are you? Well, I'm a little OCD. You're, you're, you explain yourself as maybe on the spectrum or having, a, you know, a touch of autism when you're a little socially awkward. You, if you're moody, you might say, I'm a little bipolar. There are critics of that usage, right? They say, no, let's not use those terms. These are serious terms. You can't have PTSD from a bad econ economics exam in college, you know? PTSD can lead to great suffering and suicide. OCD can be extraordinarily debilitating. There are people with autism who are um, in residential institutions needing lifelong care and are self-injurious. So we shouldn't use these terms so lightly when they're so serious. But I take a different view. I take the view that when we use these terms to refer to ourselves, we're identifying that we are on the same spectrum as those who are more seriously affected that we share a common human condition that we understand. We disarm those words to hurt. We take away the power of those words to hurt because now we use them in general. And so we have the ability to move along that spectrum. I'm a big fan, therefore, of using those terms. And I don't think that people are so ignorant that if they're socially awkward and they say they're on the spectrum that they don't understand what profound autism is. They understand that when the student says she has PTSD from taking an econ exam, she knows about the terrible PTSD of people who've suffered through wars and genocide. But it is an acknowledgement that these are part of the human condition. And in a way, by saying that they are sort of normal to be sick, you take away the concept of normal. I mean, normal then is pretty much everything. If it's everything, it's nothing. One of the things that fascinates me about the word normal, and, and we touched upon this earlier, is how, how invasive it has been to other language groups. Yeah. It's not an Indigenous concept to the vast majority of languages around the world, to the point that a lot of uh, non-English, non-Franco-Germanic languages need to either borrow the word normal entirely, such as Indonesian and Malaysian, or they have to create a new compound word entirely. And it interests me that for such a young concept, a concept that entered the lexicon fairly recently, linguistic terms, it has nonetheless been incredibly, it has traveled really well around the globe mm, and yeah. been adopted so readily. And, I, and, and that seems to go hand in hand with the adoption of, of capitalism, with the adoption of Western modes of psychi psychiatric diagnosis, do you have any ideas or have you thought much about why normality is such an appealing concept that it's adopted by all these languages and cultures around the world? Well, I think one of the things that has happened since the late 1800s is the 
and but I mean, it started before then, but really kind of took off with the growth of psychology at the end of the 1800s. The idea that there are particular kinds of people, there are identities that are different from ethnic identities or religious identities. There are identities that that have to do with the mind and with cognition and you know the sorts of things that become behavioral disorders. So, you know, before the late 1800s, there were no homosexuals in the world. Now, that's not to say that men didn't have sex with men, women have sex with women, but the action was what was punished, not the identity. You know, back in the 1500s, when King Henry VIII passed his anti-sodomy law, he didn't pass that to criticize people who were homosexuals. It was to people who committed an act that was not approved of. It's only in 1892 that the word homosexual is actually invented. It doesn't enter the Oxford English Dictionary until 1976. But over the course of the last century, we've developed an increasing number of kinds of people, the stuff that the philosopher Ian Hacking has written about so brilliantly. And as we develop classifications of different kinds of people, we're going to uh, be relying on notions of normal and abnormal people. That is normal and abnormal is another kind in Ian Hacking's term, if that makes any, any sense, where we're moving things away from behavior toward kind of identities and inner dispositions. We have a very, in, in some ways, we, we kind of have a very static sense of identity and a very static sense of self in contrast to societies that might recognize the actions but don't pull that together into a fixed and stable identity right. that stays with the person for the rest of their life. And, That's and exactly right. And gender is a great example of that, right? Because you have societies that have multiple genders. And if you go back, and I talk about this in Nobody's Normal, if you go back to the, you know, before the late 1700s in Western Europe, you didn't even have a category of the female. There were women and men, but they were all expressions of an underlying sex that was considered to be male. And almost all the anatomical uh, explorations were of women because it was such an aberration. Why? Why don't they look just like men? And there wasn't even a separate anatomical nomenclature for the female reproductive anatomy uh, genitals until the late 1700s, when in the Industrial Revolution, scientists decided that it was time to separate out men and women into fixed biologically rooted identities. So what we think about those fixed identities of male and female as being in nature forever, that you know, it's impossible that they could never have existed as two separate things. But conceptually, it didn't, right? And so gender is a good example of how we assume that the identities that we use and the kinds of people that we identify are fixed when in fact they were constructed. It's so hard to see that, you know, it's, it's just like a big intellectual leap of faith that it's very, that's hard to imagine that there were no homosexuals in the past. It's hard to imagine that there were no females before the 1700s. These counterintuitive claims are so tough. And we anthropologists spend almost all of our energy trying to convince people that these counterintuitive claims are true because we are cultural beings who are constantly constructing our meanings. Yeah. And we, you know, growing up in a, in an age where I'm learning science and religion, uh, it, it was quite, that part of your book was quite eye-opening for me in the sense that prior to the advent of science and science education, this very biblical understanding of the body that Eve came from Adam and, and that this shaped notions of gender entirely, that was very eye-opening for me. And that, that maps into a whole cosmology that's very different. And so the importance of, of a book like Nobody's Normal is that it maps out the concept of normality, not just as a philosophical concept that um, is, a, is a dictionary entry, but that it's a, a node on a part of a network. And mm. it's a very influential node that shapes the way in which we have psychiatric nosologies, the way in which we understand the etiology of disease. Yes. And if we take seriously the notion that we can, we have the possibility of, of just disbanding normality completely, where to from here? Where do we go? Well, let me, let me preface my comment by saying that, you know, 
talking about this concept of normality with you and talking about it with you as somebody in Australia <laughs> makes me feel, gives me some trepidation because the real, you know, experts on the history of normality are Peter Kreil and Elizabeth Stevens in <laughs> Australia, right? So, you know, I got to put, you know, give props to them, right? They were tremendously influential, influential in, in uh, much of the book. But I think that where we're going from here is something that I write about at the end of the book in a strange way. You know, you wouldn't think that you'd be writing about normality and, and diversity in the 21st century by going back to a novel that was written in 1850 about the Puritans. But I start the last chapter of Nobody's Normal with a discussion of Hester Prynne, who's the lead char main character in Nathaniel Hawthorne's book, The Scarlet Letter. And I don't know about in Australia, but in the US high school students, almost all of them read The Scarlet Letter. And most people know the story is about a woman who's convicted of adultery in Puritan times. And uh, she has to wear a red or scarlet letter A on her blouse. And she goes away in a kind of self-exile for a long time. And she comes back after years and years and years away after wearing, you know, she's, and she's still wearing this letter A. And people say, why are you still wearing that thing? It's been years since you committed adultery. And even the harshest judges say, no, no, you can take that off. And she says, oh no, I'm not taking it off because, and Nathaniel Hawthorne uses the word stigma in his 1850 novel. He said, she says, this has ceased to be a stigma. It is now a sign of my strength and my endurance and my resilience. And she settles back in the village and other people, when they have problems, particularly problems of misplaced passions, come to her for counsel. Like that A is a ancient clinical degree in psychology. And why? Because they know that she's actually more similar to them than she is different. They have come to understand her as she wanted to be seen, as she wanted to be understood. She took ownership of that A and said, I'm going to redefine this. I'm going to, you know, this thing was a stigma. I'm going to say, no, this is not a stigma. This is a sign of strength, resilience, and endurance. And then other people buy into that, rightly so, and respect her for who she is and see that they, you know, they didn't, they're almost on the same spectrum, right, of, of having the normal difficulties of life. And so what Hester Prynne did is what my students are doing now. It's kind of what my daughter did when she gave a graduation speech from her high school. She was the first person with a disability to give a graduation speech from her high school. 3,000 people at the Daughters of the American Revolution Constitution Hall across the street from the White House. And there were 3,000 people there. And most of these kids and families didn't know my daughter because she'd been in special ed, you know, self-contained classes, you know, for other kids with autism and other disabilities. And when she started to speak, she spoke in a, her sort of odd rhythm, a kind of sing-song pattern that she has, and she uses very formal language. And you could hear people whispering and a couple chuckling and... Um, murmuring and, you know, murmurs are the sounds of stigma. And then she gets to a point in the speech where she says, people like au with autism like me. And then you could just feel the room quiet down. You could feel it as well as hear it quiet down because she had provided this framework. She had made herself visible in the way that she wanted to be seen. And now people had a framework for understanding her and a framework that the neurodiversity movement had helped destigmatize. And then she got a standing ovation. I mean, this was, it sort of still gives me goosebumps to, to tell the story because it was this single moment, this microcosm of how we see, how we can redefine the meanings of ourselves for others. I, I find that a profoundly touching story, not just, um, because it, it comes from the father of a person who sounds like a, an, incre an incredibly accomplished person, but also because of the significance that moment means culturally in the way in which it, it denotes and is emblematic of, of the understanding that we're coming to in society about um, people with experiences that differ from our own. We're seeing more and more of these moments. And that's why, 
I'm not trying to be a Pollyanna, but I am very, very optimistic about the future, if based only on my daughter's experience. What questions should we ask about normality to move the discussion into a, into, to keep the momentum going in a, in a constructive and, and more inclusive space? We should ask ourselves how we have the power through our culture to, to change it. And we should ask ourselves the question of whether what we think is real is real. Is it in nature or did we make it? You know, stigma is not in nature. It's something that we learn and we can always change what we teach. And the goal is for us to understand that even biologically rooted conditions, something where we can say it is biological is susceptible to cultural change. And sometimes it's just little things, renaming a condition or giving somebody an opportunity to take a risk when we don't think that they can achieve something because of a disability, but let them fail and take a risk just like any other person. No, don't overprotect them. Or when we have somebody with a disability give a graduation speech, right? So I think we shouldn't minimize the importance of little victories. Is it in nature or is it, is it something we made? I, I yeah, love that's, the, that's the question. But, and, and it's as simple as that. It's such a beautiful way of distilling some really profound thought thinking around the question of normality. And, and I'm really enjoying your book and I wish I'd, I've really enjoyed Thanks it. Thanks so much. You. Thank you so much for, um, for spending the time to allow me to um, pull at your brain and, and find sure. out. And I guess people you. can... I mean, the book is available on, on audio and Kindle, um, and uh, the audio is not me. It's a professional narrator um, and, and, you know, is a hard copy. And I guess you can get it even in Australia, even though I don't have a, yet have a uh, sort of UK Commonwealth contract, but I'm glad and I uh, hope people find the book enjoyable. All the best with the, with Thank the you. ongoing success of this book. And don't forget to look for Professor Richard Roy Grinker's book in wherever you can find it. And also, thank you for watching Idioms and Normality. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. 